Okay, all right, well everybody, my name's John August. Um, you know, I, I have a physics degree, I have an interest in science communication. Um, if you do a bit of a hunt, hunting on the web, you'll find I've put together quite a few, uh, quite a few things on the, uh, on the 2SCR diffusion radio program. So that's their science program, that's uh, broadcast weekly, and there are quite a few podcasts of that available on the internet. Um, I've also given a few courses at the WEA, that's one day courses, things like science all around us, physics all around us, you know, issues in, in global resources and so on. And coming up there are two, I have a, a one hour thing on uh, sustainable energy and energy in the future. And then there's also a one day course that I have on, you know, geology, earth sciences, astronomy, you know, planetary, this, that, the other. And those things are coming up at WEA. But okay, yes, today I'm going to be talking about the origins of life, and you know, admittedly that's not really my qual qualified field. But along the way, I've taken quite an interest in medicine, genetics, and you know, biochemistry, and so on, and I guess picked up a reasonable amount along the way. And you know, certainly from science fiction, you sort of say, well, what is life? What is alien life going to be like? And and where did it come from? And you know. I, I can only say maybe two or three years ago it was all a bit overwhelming for me and I did actually try to engage with it you know reasonably methodically and try to make sense of things and sort of say well where does life come from and there's still a lot that we don't know but there's a lot of the picture that I think it is possible to tell and there's some interesting things that you can say so um, I suppose I might sort of ask around you know, um, I suppose some of our fundamentals are uh, uh, DNA, um, amino acids, uh, proteins, you know, RNA, I guess cell walls, these are the things that we think about when we have cells. So, you know, is anybody here familiar with DNA, RNA, amino acids, proteins, you know, do we, uh, okay, a, a, a little bit of a reaction there. Well, never mind, I'll, I'll sort of try to give a bit of an idea of, of where I'm going to be about and come from. Now, one of the things I'm going to talk about is what is life or what is cellular life. Now, cellular life is the, the big question of how our cells sort of do stuff. And, you know, DNA, amino acids, proteins and so on, that's very important to that. And I'll also be talking a bit about how our bodies work. That's not really relevant to life itself, but it gives you a bit of a picture of what proteins do and how they operate. I mean, mostly we're interested in how proteins make cells operate, but proteins, hormones, whatever you might say, they make our bodies work, and our bodies are multicellular <coughs> things, and it gives you a bit of a perspective on that. So um, then, you know, I do actually plan to look a bit at how DNA and proteins and so on operate in our cells, because when we talk about life, I guess what we want to understand is how did cells come about? And, you know, let's say I'm putting, going to throw away a lot of the picture of how uh, multicellular organisms form, we know that. The question is how those first cells form and how they came about. And I'll be talking about a, a, few, a few of the things, like there are stages. One thing is to say, in nature, how might we have amino acids and you know the bits of cells, the bits of DNA, how might they form? And then how might they form into longer chains? And you know, there's two stages. The longer chain part is, is, is an interesting part, quite apart from the individual bits forming. Um, then uh, we can sort of look at how that might have happened in, in history and then I guess there's different pictures they have of early life, there's the RNA world, there's the met metabolic world, the iron sulphide world and so on and various different views of how things came about. Finally I'll look, well not so much finally, but I will look at my own favourite theory uh, which is my own very speculative one and I'll emphasise that that's uh, based on um, DNA actually cat catalyzing cooperatively and basically single strand DNA chemistry is a thing that I am quite passionate about and that's a different version to a current DNA. Our current DNA very good at reproducing itself but I imagine a single strand of DNA operating a bit like a Turing machine if anybody remembers that metaphor with the tape getting built up at either end. So that's what I will think of. And then I'll go on to alien life and you know what are the conditions that we might need for life and how that might have happened in an alien context. And finally, though, this is mostly about the origins of life. There's not, not a great deal to say, I have to say, about the, the future of human life because mostly we're interested in multicellular cells and how they operate, which we sort of understand, and that's something more about how we understand life. But OK, um, getting to a, a start of things. Um, our, our cells have got uh, DNA. Now, DNA is basically the in, encoding of the cells. It tells us how our cells work. 
and you know life is about the DNA that's like the information that runs us and so to speak that is shall we say the tape that runs into the milling machine or whatever you know this goes back a few decades ago once upon a time you used to have you know milling equipment lays and so on you actually feed tape into them which would be the instructions to make those things happen and that would sort of mill stuff and then that's your instructions, that's your DNA, and then your proteins are the things that would come out of that process and the proteins would uh, guide our chemical reactions along to make the cells happen. Because what, what do our, our cells need? Um, our cells have got uh, nutrients and energy, they sort of scavenge nutrients and energy from the environment, they maintain the cell, and then they reproduce and they also mutate along the way. Now, how do they maintain the cell? There's your cell wall. Okay, now your cell wall actually uh, is, a, is a lot like a detergent. Um, I don't know if people know how detergent and soap works. Well, anyway, detergent and soap, you have a, a little uh, a, a straight, a detergent molecule which has a water-loving end and a water-hating end. And what you have to make soaps work, you have little blobs of oil in your clothes and basically the, the uh, the water heating end pushes itself into the blob and the water loving end hangs around that and basically have a bit of a sphere and what soap does in a sense it helps oil to dissolve in water and when oil dissolves in water then it can actually find its way out of the clothes and you can clean that. Okay so hopefully that's, that's making sense to some degree. Now the thing is if you actually get these things in water then um, just a moment, if you get, get these things in water Find the uh, find the picture. Just a moment. Okay, now I wonder. Okay, that that'll. Okay, this may not be the the, the best thing, but notice that I don't know how well you can see that. You can maybe pass this tablet around. Please give it back to me. But what that's saying is that your basically your your two ends of the the soap molecule or your detergent molecule see the top layer likes water the bottom layer likes water and the way it forms itself into a stable aggregation is to form a sheet and that sheet can then actually form a cell membrane so you may not think it but our cell membranes actually owe a lot to the way soap works and detergent works you know so you get something like a soap detergent a lipid whatever you can form yourself a cell wall okay so we've actually demarcated our cell there's the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell inside of the cell you have DNA the DNA is generating protein and the protein is running the metabolism of the cell. Now, is, is that making sense or are people confused by, by that statement? Uh, okay, and uh, does anybody need to look at that or can you pass it around? Okay, all right, there we are, you can pass that one around. Okay, so that's sort of how the cell wall happens. So, so, so now let's take a step away from the actual cell itself to our bodies and we have things called uh, hormones and we also have some chemicals running around in our bodies and again this is separate to the cell but it hopefully gives us a bit of an insight into what's going on now inside of our bodies we do have things called hormones one thing is called insulin right so that's generated in one part of the body the pancreas goes through the bloodstream and uh, affects the cells and the cells then store glucose inside so it's, insulin is actually a signal that does that it doesn't actively do that the cells process the glucose by their own means now what that's telling us is that this thing called insulin is a hormone it's a signal and some of the cells make that now what do they what is the hormone the hormone is a protein okay now there's various different sorts of protein a hormone is a signaling protein now that uh, that, that protein is made out of smaller things called amino acids. Okay, so my, amino acids, there's 20 odd amino acids, they're like the building blocks of, of things. You basically arrange them together in different patterns and they can do different things. Alright, so is it, are we get, getting the idea of here's things called amino acids and proteins? Is that sort of make, making sense so far, I hope? Okay, so amino acids and proteins. Now notice, one sort of protein is, uh, is just a chemical that's different to other chemicals. Let's say insulin is an example of that. It's a bit arbitrary, it doesn't really do much, but it can actually dis dis distinguish against other chemicals, so it is a signal chemical. But there are other proteins that actually do something. Two things that I will mention are haemoglobin in our blood cells, 
and chlorophyll, which processes light in plants. Now, are any of us familiar with you know, haemoglobin, the part of red, red blood cells? Now, the thing about that haemoglobin is, if I remember the chemical structure correctly, it's got four amino acids and an iron atom in the middle. Now, the thing about holding that iron atom in a particular way means the iron atom can actually attract oxygen to it, and it can release oxygen. So haemoglobin metaphorically increases the solubility of oxygen in a fluid, and that means you can pump oxygen around your body. So notice the difference there is that particular amino acid does something. It does something chemical. So basically, insulin could have been a whole host of other proteins, just as long as everyone communicated accurately and knew what, what insulin was intended to do. But with haemoglobin, because it does something active, it's a chemical, it couldn't be any other way. It has to be something very special that makes oxygen more soluble in the fluid. Okay? And then you have uh, chlorophyll. Now chlorophyll is another protein and that one is very specialised in that if light hits chlorophyll it can initiate a chemical reaction. Most of the time light hits something and all it does is might blow off an electron, re recapture the electron and it's a bit warmer as a result. Most of the time light flows around and it just heats things up. But uh, with chlorophyll it's different. It has a very particular chemical configuration so that you can do that. Now, there's a few other proteins you have. A keratin, I think that's in hair, nails, I think that's also in, in crab shells and various other things. So the protein called keratin, it's sort of structural. So there's a lot of chem, chem, uh, proteins in our bodies that do structural things. And all these proteins are composed of those 20 odd amino acids assembled together in a particular way. Okay, so that, that's, that's your hormones, which are also proteins combined of amino acids, and the instructions to say how do we actually organise these amino acids into a particular pattern to make a particular protein that does a particular task, that information is stored in the DNA strand. And the next hidden part to how a cell operates is how does the cell reproduce its DNA? Well, it uses amino acids, which no, rather... How does it re reproduce the DNA? It uses proteins. Proteins reproduce the DNA. Aha, but you need DNA to make proteins. So in a sense, you have to have both of them operating hand in hand together. At the moment, we cannot have one without the other. Right, so there's this, there, there's this sort of uh, reciprocal relationship between the two of them. Now, is that making sense so far that, that you know, this is how cells operate? So, so that is one of the challenges is that basically DNA has the information and proteins are the things that do, do the stuff. And how do you have one without the other? Basically proteins run the metabolism, DNA runs the information store and you normally need both of them. Can you imagine something half a cell running that only has metabolism but doesn't add information? If you have something that only has DNA or only has information, how does that come about without the met metabolism to help things copy and reproduce? Right, so that is one of the challenges of life, is, is how do you get around this problem that at the moment you, you can't have one without the other. The, I'm assuming that there was an early stage of life which was one without the other, or somehow the things developed and unfolded and they did it in a, a spontaneous sort of way. Now, what I'm going to do now, is, you know, as I continue, I'll tell the story which I think is a plausible story. Um, but as you look at the internet, you'll find that there is some controversy over whether the conditions could ever have been around on Earth that would have facilitated the development of these chemicals. And your various creationists will actually say, no, that's not ever possible, and, you know, it is actually impossible. And I think they miss out on some of the pictures. I will be going in some other parts of the picture. But the interesting thing is, if you look at the chemistry and the explanation of the chemistry, some of the most lucid and readable explanations of the chemistry are actually put together by creationists. However, even if you run with those creationist uh, explanations, then you sort of say, well, maybe there wasn't a god, but maybe we were actually seeded with life from like alien meteorites. You know, that's, that's one of the radical theories around. Or maybe some aliens actually came in and did that deliberately, and that's sort of your Raelian theory. So it's difficult to distinguish your uh, god-based uh, intelligent design from your Raelian alien-based intelligent design, and that's, that's something to keep in mind there. But for the moment, I'm going to assume that there's an interesting story to be tell, told about how life arose from chemicals on Earth. It's going to be difficult for me to prove things, but I'm going to tell a story which, which I hope will be feasible. So, 
So I've, I've to told us a, a, a few things there. Now, um, if you go back far enough, so let's now focus on just making amino acids and uh, maybe making some bits of the DNA chain. Now, one of the things is we do actually know that out there in the universe we have amino acids on uh, meteorites and you know, basically they do get naturally generated. So amino acids in one sense are not that difficult and in fact there are actually stories about picking up meteorites from space and smelling them and they smell of vinegar, right? So acetic acid can actually be generated off in the vastness of space without presumably biological activity. Um, but does anybody know about the Miller-Uri experiment, however you say that one? Uh, okay, may maybe not. Okay, I think this goes back to 1950s and 1960s. There were these uh, scientists who put a mixture of gases. They had, I think, something like <coughs> carbon monoxide, uh, ammonia, a carbon monoxide, ammonia, um, uh, probably some nitrogen, nitrogen oxide, those sorts of things. Put them in a container and put a spark on it and over time, between the sparks and that gas, it actually formed a lot of amino acids. So, so there, there's the thing there, that you have that atmosphere with a bit of sparking, you'll generate amino acids. Right, and that was your Miller-Urey experiment. Now what that atmosphere is, notice we are used to nitrogen molecules, carbon dioxide, water, uh, oxygen molecules floating around. Now that is what we call an oxidising atmosphere, okay? So basically there's lots of oxygen there, it's called an oxidising atmosphere. And if you change the chemistry and start to take out the oxygen and gradually put in a surplus of uh, hydrogen, then it becomes what is called a reducing atmosphere. Now, a reducing atmosphere, um, so that means rather than nitrogen molecules, you've got ammonia. Ammonia is, I think, NH4. Rather than carbon dioxide, you have carbon monoxide. Um, and um, rather than water, which is H2O, you actually have hydrogen. So that's your early reducing atmosphere. You apply sparks, you apply energy to that reducing atmosphere, you can generate amino acids. Right, so the first part of that um, can, can be done. So we now have our amino acids. Uh, so so that, that, that's, that's one half of the reaction now. Now then there's a bit of historical discussion of was our atmosphere reducing in early time? because we assume that we've got oxygen now, but before we had oxygen in the environment, there was a time when we didn't really have much oxygen around, we had a reducing environment, and so these sorts of things could have happened. Because if you have oxygen in that environment, much oxygen, maybe a tiny amount you can get away with, but if you have much oxygen, you will not generate these amino acids, right? You have to have a reducing <coughs> atmosphere. And one of the things of like geological history and debate is, did we actually have this reducing atmosphere in times long past? So that's a bit of, bit of history there. Now I won't go into too much of the debate there. There's things about geology, they look at the rocks that have formed, they can date the rocks and they can say, well, aha, this rock must have formed in a reducing environment. So we can say there probably was a reducing environment. Then once you had small bits of life generating oxygen, then it changed from being a reducing atmosphere to an oxidising atmosphere. But some of the story, it, it, you are, you do have bits of it, you don't have a detailed story, and you can say, well, to this point it was probably oxidising, and before this point it was reducing, and we think life occurred there. Life had photosynthesis, photosynthesis squared, lots of oxygen, so that's when we had the transition. But we can't generate amino acids in the current environment. We have to say that there was an early environment where you could do that. So that's our first part of our recipe is, uh, is, is, is our uh, amino acids. Now there are other parts of the recipe. There's DNA and some of the things that we can form towards DNA. There's also another chemical involved in our body called RNA. Now this is making the story a bit more complicated, but what happens is you have your DNA, which um, I guess to use a computing metaphor, oh I don't know, is your, is, is your core storage back at the server and that's your, your, your DNA, and then you copy that to something called RNA. And your RNA might be a working floppy disk or whatever, which you then take over to your machine and pop it in the machine. That's your RNA. And your RNA then directly actually makes the proteins. There's a convoluted process by which you actually make proteins. I have to acknowledge it, it, it is quite complicated. So, uh, so, so we have our DNA, our RNA, and our uh, and our proteins. Now, okay, I guess guess I'm, I'm darting around here a bit. 
But now I want to explain a few of the things about proteins and cat catalysis of reaction, or catalyzing reactions. Now, I suppose people may know that we have a, some of us have a catalytic converter in our cars. Um, I think that's perhaps, is it platinum, platinum traces or something like that? Ian, you'd, you'd perhaps know a bit more about that. So we have catalytic converters in our cars. Um, but does it, there's also things called enzymes which are uh, catalytic agents. Now, when I say catalytic agent, does anybody know what I'm talking about here? Uh, some, 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 some people are nodding. Well, anyway, you know how you have basically, in a sense, if you have a whole bunch of chemicals in a pot and just heat them, they'll, they'll, all sorts of chemical reactions can happen. You know, basically, just like a kid assembling lim Lego blocks together randomly. You know, this one might fit to that and that one might fit to that. And that's a bit of the story of what happened with the Muller-Uri experiment. Basically, these atoms just bash into each other and eventually some of them turn into something interesting, some of them turn into something that we find particularly relevant. But what a catalytic agent does, it speeds up the speed of some particular chemical reaction. And basically, that's what a lot of our cells do. For our cells, the proteins act as catalytic agents. The proteins speed up a particular chemical reaction. And one of the things is you say, oh, it's speeding up, you know, what's relevant there? Well, if you sort of say, here's a bunch of stuff, we, we put them together and boil them for a while, and we have like a thousand different possible chemicals, right, just, just through sheer randomness and them just bashing each other together. But if you have a cat catalytic agent that makes three or four chemical reactions a thousand times faster, then you put that in with the catalytic reagent, and rather than having like a thousand different chemical reactions, a thousand different chemicals, 99% of the resulting chemicals will be three things, and a tiny number will be all those others. Right? So you see that a catalytic agent not only does it speed up a reaction, but when there's a whole range of reactions, it's going to focus on a few, and you're going to focus on just a few um, things coming out the other end. Is that sort of making sense there? Okay. So. So, in a sense, when our cells operate, I suppose one of the things is they draw in the chemicals inside of them, and then because of the catalytic reagents, they direct the reactions to certain things that the cell wants. It may want to form cell walls, it may want to form the raw material of the DNA so it can reproduce the DNA chain, it may want to form certain chemicals which help to either capture the light coming in through, uh, through chlorophyll, or may do chemosynthesis because there may be some energy bearing chemicals that sort of filter into the cell and it makes sort of use of them. So, so that's your catalytic agent. Now how is it that a catalytic reagent works? Now the point is, say you have two chemicals that just sort of bash against each other, you know, bash against each other every which way. If they hit each other at exactly the right trajectory with two mating parts meeting up exactly right, they might actually react and form the next, next chemical compound. But that combined chemical compound. This is a metaphor. Um, it's, it's one way of looking at chemistry. I hope it's accurate. One of the things is when you look into physics, some of subatomic physics is like you're cracking, stacking crates in the corner of the warehouse, okay? Some of it really is like that. You know, you can imagine that way. Other stuff is about quantum orbitals and horrible stuff like that. Let's not worry too much about the quantum orbitals. Let's worry about the stuff that's a lot more like cracking stacking crates in the corner of the warehouse because then you actually got physical things and how do they make together you can actually model a lot of what goes on in the microscopic world that way. So so here are the two things that chemicals combined, they have combined. Now from the outside they have a, a sort of a, a wiggle shall we say, a, an appearance from the outside. Now what your catalyst in one way is an exactly making thing, it looks like that pattern that it has on the outside. So here's the catalyst. One chemical compound goes bash into the catalyst and gets stuck, right? And then the other chemical compound gets, goes bash and gets stuck in the other way, and they just happen to be right in proximity where they can bond, and they do bond. Because the catalyst has formed to put them in just the right orientation so they're going to naturally bond. And it does that by having a shape which mirrors the shape of the actual uh, chemical that we want to get. Right, is that making sense? That's sort of how a, a, a catalyst works. So. One of the things we can actually have is we've got a whole lot of uh, chemicals, all amino acids, various things, all randomly combining together. Eventually, we might get a relationship between a, a given chemical that just by accident combines in such a way that it's the catalyst for another reaction. And if we actually get, let's say, a few of these things in a loop, 
we start to get a, basically a loop going and things ha start to happen which are interesting. You have an autocatalytic loop. And that is one step behind have an actual metabolism because our metabolism is some very particular uh, catalytic agents which prompt some very specific reactions which make life form. So that's why the ability to do cat catalysis is very important and one of the nice things about amino acids is there are 20 of them. It's sort of like a kid who's got lots of different sorts of Lego bricks. You can fit them together in every bloody which way and eventually you'll stumble across some pattern that actually makes sense. Eventually we'll stumble across a few different chemicals that actually interact together in an interesting way. So that's why cat catalysis is very important in this picture. So, so then, then, then sort of moving on from that, we can start with our metabolism. In other words, we're focusing on here's all our proteins all interacting and eventually you end up with some proteins doing interesting things. Those proteins doing interesting things take over the whole chemical environment and then you've got the startings of life. Another sentiment is if we take RNA, RNA does have a limited uh, catal catalytic possibility, so you can actually have something that both has information and the ability to do uh, catalysis of reactions. And that's one picture that's been had, the RNA world. We start off with RNA, which both has information and can do catalysis. Um, to some of our pictures, you have your sort of iron sulphide world, um, then there's a whole lot of other pictures of we can have imagine some clays. The clays are catalyzing the joining of amino acids into proteins. You know because one of the things is that generally speaking, if you we can we can make our amino acids, but the amino acids tend not to agglomerate into longer chains. When you fit the amino acids together, they make proteins. Proteins could do something interesting, but. While we can make the amino acids, amino acids don't naturally have an inclination towards forming into chains, right? They, basically, you need clays to do that. If you do it in water, they're probably not going to do that. But there are other exotic possibilities for our, our imagined dim and distant past. Now, one of them is the formation of ice. When ice forms into a crystal, uh, what's in between will increase its concentration, so you can concentrate stuff, and that's sort of an interesting thing. Then there's also another version of water called supercritical water. No, nobody's heard of supercritical water? Well, anyway, basically, supercritical water, it's very high temperature, very high pressure water. When you go through a certain transition state, water turns into something else. Um, one of the stories with supercritical water is you can have oxygen dissolved in the water, and the, that oxygen-rich, supercritical water can actually sustain a flame underwater, right? Very exotic stuff. You know, water has turned into something very different. And when that happens, you know, I'm, I'm speculating that interesting things can happen, that that's the environment where basically your amino acids can just form into random proteins, and partially they do that randomly, partially if they're prompted by catal catalytic proteins that have already formed, then certain reactions will be favoured. And you can also have things going forming into DNA as well. So, <coughs> Ian, you want to ask something? I suppose I'll, I'll, I'll indulge you. The supercritical water. Are you, put, are you putting that forward as a possible origin of life? I'm is saying this point. Yes, it's an environment. I, I mean, okay, who knows? Maybe someone will, will throw me, a, show me a paper that says no supercritical water cannot do this. But one of the general sentiments is it is difficult to form amino acids into proteins in a regular water-type environment. So how do we form them into proteins? We can imagine clays that form as a catalyzing agent to actually form proteins. Um, under some conditions we can heat them well, or we can hope that in supercritical water they'll be more able to form proteins. But if that requires high pressure, it couldn't occur on the surface of the Earth, could it? No, you wouldn't have that going on the surface of the Earth, it would happen in your deep hydrothermal vents. Right, basically deep in the bottom of the ocean, it's high enough pressure and high enough temperature coming out of the deep undersea volcanoes and hopefully enough interesting gases and, and various things there that you could actually have life forming there. Because that is one of the theories of life, that life originally formed in the hydrothermal vents. Right, it was basically that very exotic life that slowly over time turned into the more mundane life that we're familiar with. You're at, you're at 30 minutes. Okay. All right, so, um, so there's... Okay, so there's... Uh, supercritical water in, in deep hydrothermal vents. But the point, point is we have our different chemical things 
the precursor of the DNA, the precursor of the RNA, the precursor of the proteins called amino acids. If we can get a nice effervescent environment where they all start to fit together randomly and do random things and start to assemble themselves into long chains, eventually one of those chains will do something interesting and have a catalytic relationship with something else. And if we're lucky, we'll, we'll have a bit of a loop. Okay, so that's more the, the general story. Um, now I'll actually go into my own particular view of how things might have might have originated and this is where I'm being quite uh, speculative but uh, DNA I'm thinking might well catalyze some reactions because one of the things about uh, DNA again I wonder if I'll, I'll try to get this picture happening Okay, now, uh, it, I guess you can no, maybe pass this around again. Now, there's our DNA chain. It's got, got, got the, got the two, two things there. And if we look at it in a bit more detail, there's the two halves. Now, notice with the DNA, the two halves link together. And what you actually have with the DNA is different patterns, okay? I guess I'll pass that around and people can have a bit of a look at that. But one thing of the DNA has up, up, down. Another one has up, down. Now the point is, you can have a DNA chain which has some sort of sawtooth configuration. And while it's not quite the nice three-dimensional uh, catalytic agent we remember, it's a certain sawtooth, and that might correspond to like the other half of some chemical that we're wanting to make. So one thing to keep in mind is all of our life that we know uses two strings of DNA, right? Now we've got to say, now that DNA maybe did something else before it was two-stranded DNA. But we've lost that. Those, those things are not, don't exist anymore. All trace of them is gone. So what happened before we had twin strand DNA? Twin strand DNA is very good at copying itself. But what might have happened before, you might have had single strand DNA, which sort of built linearly rather than copying itself. And it built linearly because there were these enzymes that helped build into a long chain. And basically it had a relationship between the DNA chain and some proteins that were hanging around. And that was a single chain, uh, single chain event. So that's where I'm thinking life actually started. And the thing is, all the life we know is about dual chain DNA, and all the chemical research is about how DNA chains reproduce. It's not about the chemistry of a single, single strand of DNA that's not mated with its opposite. But I'm thinking that's what might have happened. And one of the things about evolution is so often there is a, within evolution there is a ad adaptive leap. Like let's say there was a meteor strike and some plankton survived. The plankton that survived were the plankton that were able to hibernate for winter. In effect it was a very long winter, it may have been a five year winter. But the plankton that were able to hibernate could survive that asteroid strike which, which sorted up the atmosphere. And that was an adaptive leap. Um, you know, your, uh, uh, your, your strands out of your, um, your cells, the flagella, right? Flagella actually d developed from something else and that developed from something else. There was what you might call an adaptive leap. So it's dual strand DNA was an adaptive leap from something else that, that was, had something in common but did something different. And I think that's the chemistry of single strand DNA. All right. So anyway, so I'll put all that to one side and actually look at alien life and um, and other forms of and other forms of life. Now, one of the things about our planet is what happened. We had this uh, solar system disk around the point of Earth. You had, you know, some heavy metals, some light metals, some water, some this, and you had this glob of, of, of rock and metal and so on, and some fluids and some lighter elements, and that formed into our planet, which had water, which had certain chemicals. And you know we don't know too much about that, but let's say if you had another planet forming in similar conditions, and we basically had carbon-based life, well, you might have that happening in uh, another an, another solar system forming carbon-based life, roughly as we know it. Now, remember how I did actually say that uh, with with our cells, insulin in our bodies is insulin, but it could have been something else. Now, in our life history, there's a whole lot of things that are a bit arbitrary. It had to be something, but it could have been something else. So while maybe DNA is the only easy way of storing information, um, there might well be other ways of, of taking, going from DNA to proteins. There might have been other ways of doing that. There might have been other proteins that were formed. You know, assuming we have amino acids 
and DNA. So it could still have some of the stuff that we have the same that had to be that way, but where, we, where evolution made an arbitrary choice, it might have been different. And that's assuming we have something that's vaguely related to proteins, <coughs> vaguely related to DNA, still a lot of freedom. But if we go to the next step beyond that, what, do, what, does, life, what does life need? Sorry, I lost it. You lost it, okay. Sorry. I think you're the last person to look at it, so that's all right. Um, okay, so, so, they're, they're, so what does life need? Now what I was trying to say is life needs two things. It needs a store of information, in our case that's called DNA. It needs a way of promoting some particular chemical reactions, we call that proteins. It needs a way of delineating the cell from other things, which is the cell wall. Now, we know one way of doing that, but maybe there are other chemicals that can do that, ones that we don't know about. That would be your truly alien life. It might have something other than the DNA storing information. It might have something other than proteins doing the chemical processing. Having said that, given that we even have amino acids on meteorites, maybe amino acids are pretty common and you probably get proteins happening. But maybe there's something else. And maybe there is actually another thing that both stores the information and promotes certain chemical reactions at the same time. Our life has it separated into DNA and proteins, but there may be other ways of doing it. So, so you know, there's some of the ideas of alien life. How similar is the alien life to, to us going to be? It could be DNA the way we have it, uh, DNA protein the way we have it, DNA protein sort of the way we have it, but some of the encoding is different. It could be something other than DNA, but it does the job that the DNA and the protein does using a completely different chemical envelope. And then, of course, you have the thing of um, maybe this could be happening in solution in ammonia rather than water. It's interesting. Water is actually it's so vital for life as we know it, but water also inhibits the formation of these long-chain uh, DNA and um, proteins in some way. So, you know, water is this thing that we have a love-hate relationship as far as the origin of life goes. And maybe things could happen in a gaseous environment. Reactions would be a lot slower, but who knows? Okay, so there we have, so there's me talking about alien life. Now, the last thing I was going to talk about was future human life. Now, one of the things I've emphasised in this talk is things like early life, you know, single strand DNA, that sort of thing. Now, I know we're making, we're making a lot of progress in understanding cells as we know it, proteins as we know it, DNA as we know it, and who knows where that will take us. Um, but I guess I have to say, when you're looking at the origins of life, um, that's an interesting story to, to, to be told. But it is a bit different to the to what we're doing, the, 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 to our understanding of, of double-strand DNA and, and how life as we know it operates. So it's a slightly different story, but let's just say, as we understand more and more things, more and more things become possible. So uh, so I think I'll, I'll close off my talk at that point. That's probably about 40 minutes, I hope? Or... Yeah, just about. All right, All right. well, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I hope you found right. that interesting. I might just add a bit more to the to the future human life. I mean, that's my particular area of interest. Um, to to add a little bit to what John's been saying, in the human genome, I suppose people have heard of the human genome. There's about, at the moment, people think about 25,000 genes um, spliced together in different ways that gives you maybe 100,000 or or more different effects from the from the different genes that are there. Now that, that, that 25,000 genes in humans has taken three and a half billion years to evolve. And it's, a, it's a ran, essentially a random process. And the, and the fittest survive and go on to reproduce. Now, the situation is quite different, has turned into quite a different situation in the last 30, 40 years. Because humans have worked out that DNA is actually the store of all the information that codes all life as we know it, and we're actually able to intervene now. So, whereas if you can think about how evolution has worked for that three and a half billion years, it's been at the expense of lots of individual <coughs> organisms that were less less fit and therefore died out more quickly or didn't reproduce as much or whatever. But now we're getting to the stage where humans with the technology that's been, that we're developing are able to get to the stage where we can actually intervene on a single individual and change the evolutionary path, if you like, of a single individual without having to do it on the whole population. And that's of particular interest to me and other people that have got various sorts of uh, health or other problems that could be fixed by interve intervening at the genetic level and fixing up um, different problems. 
Now, it's not just people that might have, I mean, just, just as an example, you've got 25,000 or 100,000, 100, effective 100,000 genes. Everybody has got mutations that are no good for them in that 25,000 or 100,000. To a more or less extent, it affects people. There's, there's going to be dozens of them in every single individual. If you're unlucky, you get some really nasty ones and it might kill you when you're a year old. If you've got the, the usual ones, you just get decrepit and age and, and drop dead at about 70 or 80 or something. But the, the point is that the technology is getting to the stage now where you can intervene at the genetic level to fix, potentially fix genetic diseases because the proteins that John was talking about are either not manufactured properly or they're not manufactured at all and therefore an enzyme isn't working and you develop a particular disease. Now if you, if you, in, if you use gene therapy you can whack that gene back in and restore the function that was supposed to be there or correct it or whatever. But of course <coughs> that's not the end of the story though. I mean once you've got all this wonderful technology, I mean, no one's going to stop at um, just fixing diseases and fixing ageing so people can live longer and better and healthier. People are going to start thinking, well, you know, uh, you know I, I'd like a better suntan or, you know, I'd like a straighter nose or, you know, I'd like green skin, I'd like a bit of chlorophyll in there. So people are going to start thinking about other things that could be added or changed in humans and that as soon as you start doing that it's not it's I mean people joke about it being a cosmetic thing you know because you're just talking about making beautiful people or athletic people or whatever but that's fairly trivial I mean there's all sorts of things I mean you could organize it so that the the hemoglobin that John was talking about is replaced by a much more efficient oxygen and carbon dioxide carrying molecule so that you could hold your breath for an hour or you could fix up your skin so that it was toughened so that you wouldn't need a space suit in outer space. You could just wander around as you are, with holding your breath for a few hours. So there's all sorts of possibilities, and that, um, th those things are going to start manifesting themselves in the, in the fairly near future. I mean, my particular interest at the moment is living long enough to, to get to this wonderful future in the not too distant future. But, um, and, and obviously a lot of this stuff, a lot of this work that's going on at the moment is addressing diseases and fixing up things like ageing and, and other things. But that's, that's a potential future. I mean, I've got some worries about actually surviving because of global nuclear war or environmental collapse or something like that. But assuming that we continue in the same general direction that we've been going, then the technology will be there in, in not, you know, only a few years really where people can start intervening on an individual level and individuals can start evolving, whereas before it could only be populations at the expense of the less fortunate individuals within that population. So there's a real paradigm shift, shift about to happen in the next few years. And it's pretty exciting if you can last long enough to see it. Sorry. OK, so what I was going to say now, that was more or less the talk. Um, what I'll, I'll take this thing off here now, and I'll, if people want to start asking questions, I'll take, start taking pictures well, of them as well. One question I might ask before we get into the main question and answer. So, who, who found out about this talk through uh, the Sydney Talks website? So, uh, okay, two. Okay, how about the uh, meetup group? So, okay, well, something other than those two. Uh, all right, that about cup covers it. Okay, yes, yes, okay, something other than those two. Okay, thank you. That, that's the question. One thing I was curious about. Anyone got some questions? Yeah. Well, I, I, my main reason, my main interest today is, is just would like to hear more about synthetic cells. I'm not sure if it was a bit so. Okay, well, synthetic cells, I think uh, that's something that Craig Venter has come up with where he took a cell and then manufactured a <coughs> DNA strand, put it in the nucleus, and reinserted it into that cell. So um, you know, I'm aware. I'm aware that that has actually happened. Um, at some stage, though, that's not that interesting yet because that synthetic cell, it, it's sort of a copy of an existing cell. It's just that they went through the copying process via a convoluted way. They knew what the genetic code was, and they made assemble that genetic code, as it were, from a computer record, which is sort of impressive. But it's still the copy of an existing cell just via a very convoluted means. When it gets interesting is when people actually make a cell that has some very different DNA doing some very different things. 
that... Um, Sorry, to qualify that, they have created, Venter has created a yeah. fully synthetic cell. They've used this normal cell machinery, but they did build it nucleotide by nucleotide. They did build it nucleotide yeah. by nucleotide, but it was an, a copy of an existing cell in nature. That's my understanding. No, 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 it was, it was unique. They designed it from scratch. Yeah. Was, uh, the company or was, uh... Craig, Craig Venter is the guy. He he um, he was one of the people that did the uh, the commercial version of the Human Genome Project. Well, all right. I'll have to say my understanding was that the DNA was a copy of a live cell. It was assembled bit by bit. Yeah, they have they have done that too. too yeah. Because otherwise, there would have been a risk that a new virus would have been created. Oh yeah. That wiped out humankind. Yeah, people are paranoid about that. I mean, that, they were worried about that. Yeah. yeah so my, my understanding is it was a copy of a living cell, but the DNA of that new cell was made bit by bit by synthetic means. So it's I don't know, sort of like. Um, What's, what would be the metaphor? Sort of like somebody hearing an orchestra of music and then writing down the notes from that and then getting somebody else to play it, I suppose. You know, that, that would be my, my metaphor there of what happened there. But, uh, but yeah, Philip might know more about that particular bit of science than me. I have to say. Uh, w w one thing, um, when we've had these sort of meetings before in the past, we haven't, we haven't done f filming of them before, but uh, when there's been these sorts of discussions, we've added uh, information to a page that's on the um, uh, Meetup website. So just give it a day or two and we can add some of these extra bits of links and whatever to that stuff. So if you check back in a couple of days, you should be able to get some more information about this sort of stuff. OK, are you, you in the back yeah. there? I think um, you were. Yeah, look, um you talked about this uh, oxidising atmosphere and reducing atmosphere. I assume that that reducing uh, state existed for a long time. Uh, if we assume that uh, life did start in that, do you have sort of a view on why we seem to only have a, a single tree of life rather than perhaps a, a few different trees of life that, with multiple starting points? Um, well, let's say a few, a few things are... Um, First off, the first form of life might have sort of basically put up the barriers to all other different forms of life happening. That that's one thing. But basically, the first thing, the first thing on the block stopped everything else. While that's sort of talking about the formation of life, I mean, ecologists do know about that phenomenon. You know that basically the first thing in a niche stops anything else growing there, and that's that's a known thing in biology. But the other thing I'd also say is what you're talking about potentially might have happened. Um, because they're in, in, in the tree of life, I mean, maybe you want to talk to biologists who know more about this than me, but you basically have uh, eukaryotes and prokaryotes slash bacteria, and a third thing called archaea. Now, the thing is, archaea is the stuff that, that lives in the, in, in the high temperature vents and that sort of thing, very exotic form of life and they don't interact with us. Archaea doesn't infect us at all, doesn't bother us in the least. It's like this whole parallel universe. These bugs that are out there, they're living, they're dividing, and they don't annoy us with diddly squat. You know, I nothing. thought Archaea invaded us from Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. well, again, biologists may know, actually, may know how, to, uh, how to actually pronounce these terms, but I don't think we've got anyone here to correct me yet. But, uh, but that, those are the two stories. First, first off, the first form of life may have stopped other forms of life from being generated. And secondly, there is a lot of speculation that very early life may have had a few different starting points and had some cross-transfer of genes and various other exotic things happening. Um, and, you know, the, the other thing is that basically early life might have actually absorbed uh, mit mitochondria, which then became part of the cell, so, you know, there's funny things that have happened there and there's speculation that there was gene transfer between different trees way back in the start of life. If, if that was the case, I guess, then that sort of um, hints that perhaps there is only one sort of mechanism or way in which life can operate. Um... So, certainly, that's also possible. It's also possible that, you know, what I was trying to hint at is, um, you know, I'm not much into geology or planetary geology or the formation of solar systems. But it's like, here's our planet Earth which formed with this geology and this chemistry and, and, and this distance from the sun. And it's all like rolling dice. Maybe in another solar system with roughly similar starting conditions, you had a planet about our size, about this distance from about the same sort of sun, but rather different chemistry. 
and life development, you may have had a life, but it may have developed along a slightly different trajectory because of the different raw materials that are available. But you understand that sort of starting to think about what was our planet like? Could other planets have formed with a different distribution of elements in that, in that you know, condensed mass of rock, which meant different geology and different chemistry? Maybe. I mean, I'm, I'm not that across chemistry and geology and so on, and, and planetary science and whatnot. But Ian, I think you were next. Yes. Hand up. Is it, Philip spoke about modifying living people to change their for example, their oxygen carrying capacity. Well, let's suppose that that was a bit harder. And actually, it was done with the, the germ cells, so that a new individual was born. The son of a husband and wife team of geneticists who varied the hemoglobin in their blood so they could carry twice as much oxygen, and then they would win all the Olympics. Now, would they be kicked out as jug drug cheats, or would they be allowed to compete, or what? Well, you've got to be. Presumably, if you're going to compete in the Olympic, you've got to be a human. So if you start changing your genetics too much, when do you stop becoming human? Um, usually the, 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 rule of th the rough rule of thumb in biology is that you can't interbreed with another species, but that's fairly rubbery anyway. Um, but yeah, if, if they started, if these two geneticists change their morphology, morphology so that they ended up looking like trees or something, and you couldn't breed with them anymore, then they'd probably be another species and you can't. They wouldn't be allowed in the Olympics then anyway. So. I suggest that it could well become a real problem in the next 20 years. Oh yeah, yeah there's lots of problems, so potential problems. I mean, the, the thing with, um, the thing I didn't say about evolution, it's been there working out three and a half billion years, and the ones that don't work out so well continually die off. So a human being is the end product of you know three and a half billion years of evolution. So things are working pretty well if you're sitting here breathing and talking, you know. But so it's not so easy to start messing around with something that's actually working pretty well. But they're going to do it. I mean, it's going to happen. Well, getting rid of junk DNA would be a simple thing. A lot oh, of well, DNA not... is no further function. If you eliminated it, you'd be 10 kilograms lighter and could win the high jump. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Philip, I'll, I'll, I'll butt in and say two things. I, I'm actually, okay, now, first off, Please don't imagine that I look like a certain person called Dr. Rachie, because this comment is made in, in the best of faith here. But anyway, I have, a, I have an article here that's talking about Craig Venter. But this isn't really a new life form, says Jim, Jim Collins, a synthetic biologist at Boston University. Its genome is a stitched together copy of the DNA of an organism that exists in nature. Oh, right, that's, right, that's okay, a commentary okay. on Craig Venter's uh, okay. new, new but the, genome. But they, they, they manufactured it. Nucleotide oh, by nucleotide. Nucleotide, yeah, nucleotide yeah. by nucleotide, yeah. which is why my metaphor of somebody listens to a symphony orchestra, yeah. writes down the notes, yeah. and then gets somebody else to play it. Yep. You now that's the metaphor that that I would think yeah. of, because that process of writing down the notes and getting someone else to play it is like yeah. gen generating. But, that but DNA of course, that, that's only the first step. I mean, yeah, yeah. now they'll start. You know, but that. that is point to in a moment. Um, but one of the things about our bodies is on the one hand they work but the way evolution works is it sort of adapts something for a new purpose. It doesn't design from scratch something that really works well. And as a result of that, let's say we've lost the ability to synthesize vitamin C, um, we don't metabolize uric acid very well, which is why us and some primates get gout and a lot of other mammals do not get gout. Some mammals, mammals can make their own vitamin C. So there's a lot of problems that have cropped up uh, as a result of evolution. Also, if you look at rabbits, my understanding is that rabbits have their digestive tract the wrong way round. So what they actually have to do is eat their own droppings once to digest it properly. Okay, and that is the solution evolution came up with because evolution doesn't ever back up. It sort of just goes boink, 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 you know, it doesn't actually back up and say, oh, let's try this. Or at least, let's say, evolution of higher life forms doesn't do that, I should emphasize. Microbes and bacteria can, can be very creative, you know. Um, we've lost the ability to, uh, uh, to synthesize vitamin C, but microbes divide so rapidly and have such creativity that they could do things like that. Like if you know, um, uh, you know how ruminants, uh, they process cellulose by using bacteria, right? The, the cows haven't figured out how to do that themselves. They co-opted the, the help of some bacteria. Also uh, cockroaches. 
thing about cockroaches, cockroaches can actually recycle nitrogen in their metabolism. That's why they can get by on so little food. But you know, when you stomp on a cockroach, it's got this oozy white stuff, the fat inside. There's actually bacteria inside that that help the cockroach reprocess its nitrogen, right? Us higher life forms, even insects, couldn't be creative enough to reprocess nitrogen, but bacteria can because of the way that they divide and they can try out so many things. But anyway, in the back there, wanted to say something? Oh yeah, I just had a question regarding the future of the human, of human species. Well, maybe that's more Philip's question, but go ahead. And I was just more of a, uh, um, I guess a speculative um, thing rather than a question, but do you think that the, the need for all this biology you're talking about might be mitigated by the event of the singularity? or if you know what the singularity is. Mm. I mean, do you think that that's a potential solution that could eradicate all those philosophical questions? I think I'll defer to <laughs> on that one. Um, well, yeah, I mean, if, if the singularity happens, uh, for, for people that don't know what we're talking about, there's, a, there's this hypothesis that we're at the rate at which technology and scientific information is accumulating, in the next 30 odd years or something we'll reach this so-called technological singularity where we will build artificial intelligences for example and the artificial intelligences will then build a second generation of artificial intelligences which will be much smarter than they will and you'll get this runaway technological um, explosion sort of thing and such that you can't well we can't predict in the next five years anyway so predicting 40 years away is just about impossible but in the singularity it's just impossible to predict because things go exponential very quickly and um, the possibility in that scenario is that we might abandon biological life altogether for example we might end up as some sort of virtual electronic life in a vast supercomputer or something so yeah, so there's all sorts of other possibilities if you're talking about singularity. What we're talking about is is current technology stretched a bit further, really. Yeah. Um, what about what about the possibility of uh, silicon-based life? Okay, well, I'll I can't comment on that directly. All all I can do is repeat what I was saying that life has to store information and promote certain chemical reactions. To some degree those chemical reactions uh, take advantage of nutrients in the outside environment, energy in the outside environment and probably maintaining a cell wall. If silicon based chains of stuff could carry information, if silicon based chains of stuff could form themselves into different shapes to catalyse chemical reactions, you know, maybe you could go down that path. I think one of the things that um, has been a struggle with silicon is for silicon to form chains of stuff that are sort of a bit variable so, so as you can store information you know they, they and form chains in the first place like carbon forms nice long chains um, you know I think that has been the struggle in sort of saying hey we can have silicon based life but yes if silicon can do those two things that I'm talking about then obviously you can have silicon based life uh, oh, well, you're in the back there I think you're going to ask a question uh, you mentioned um a lot about humans intervening in, um, in DNA, particularly for uh, gene therapy <coughs> in relation to disease. My question is, um, who owns the DNA? I mean, I understand there's a pharmaceutical company in America that's mapped the genome of a particular population on the, in well, Scandinavia, well, and now I, there's I can say something there, but, but, finish. but basically, under some circumstances, we own our kidneys, but we can't sell them. We own our blood, but we can't sell them. We own our arms, but we can't sell them to somebody else. So what you're doing is getting at the nature of ownership, okay? And let's say, and then I forget the particular philosopher, he said that there's two sorts of ownership. One is where, you know, I've, I've got this, and the only way you can really get it off me is by waving a knife at me or pointing a gun at me, right? That's how you get it off me. But my house at home, um, you know, basically, if, if you wander up there, there's no one to stop you from breaking in or whatever. It's basically the state that stops you from breaking in and the note and the, the fact that there's a, a, somewhere in the land titles office is some form saying, I own that property. But it, that ownership only happens because of information record somewhere else. You know, this is sort of owned in a different way. So, so that's the thing about 
uh, the title of the property that's in an information database somewhere. The title of the property, you own it even though you wander off and it's still yours, but then you actually have more abstract forms of ownership, the ownership of intellectual property. Now one of the things is then you have copyright. Copyright only persists for a certain period of time. Now, one of the fiddly things about patent law is that really patent law has never been that you can own DNA. What it has been in the past is you can own a production method for a certain period of time, right? So, and also, it's not just here's this raw information that sits there and we stumble across and go, oh wow, look at that, we own it. It's more there's an effort involved in identifying that. My understanding of the law about 10 or 20 years ago. Now, the US, my understanding is they've moved away from ownership being a productive process to ownership being an abstract thing and patent law has become more like copyright and it gets all very messy and convoluted. Um, so, I'm not really answering your question, but I'm saying the situation is very messy. Do you That's say all. people can't sell kidneys? They do. Oh, well, they can't legally do it in this jurisdiction in Australia. They can't, they can. also, also you can sell, I mean, I could sell you drugs, it's illegal, but, you know, we could actually, money could change hands, and I could sell someone drugs, but the state can't stop it unless they actually... Sorry? There's a state-supported program in Iran to sell organs to other members of the country. Yes, well, when I say legal, I say illegal in this, yeah. so, in this jurisdiction, I suppose I should say. It's not illegal in some grand...